What's crack lacking? It's your boy Bro Schmo, just in case you did not know so. And today we're looking at week 11. More specifically, we're going to look at Alabama versus LSU because that was a banger of a game. It lived up to all of the hype and there was a lot of draft worthy uh, potential prospects on the field there. So we're just going to kind of like take a take a look at that game and see how those prospects did for week 11 of the scouting report. But before we get into that, go ahead and leave a thumbs up if you enjoy the content and become a bro and subscribe. It's much appreciated, much obliged. I go ahead and I do a lot of football oriented content. But if you want to check out more of me, I think this Friday, definitely this Friday. I don't know if I'm going to be on Twitch or Mixer. I'm still looking at that. I kind of put that on the back burner. But I'm going to be doing a little game in a game there. I'm going to be playing Pokemon Sword and Shield because I'm a nerd. I love nostalgia. So uh, come check that out and do that Friday night. And uh, yeah, man, without further ado, let's get in. Let's deep dive into this game. We're going to begin with the quarterbacks because Burrow and Tua both looked great. But let's start with Burrow, who continually made the right reads against the Alabama defense. And uh, this is an Alabama defense with plenty of future NFL players. He was very poised in the pocket and he didn't let the pressure get to him. And boy, did he see pressure. I think it was on... Um, he saw 14, yeah, 14 pressures that whole game. That offensive line for LSU did not play well. But I'll get on to that later. But he kept attacking down field. And I really like what I've seen all year from him doing that. And and barring a meltdown, he should be a top five pick. Now on to Tua. He was coming off surgery on his ankle just weeks ago. And he started the game looking off a little rusty. But he came alive in that second half. He looked down the field, throwing guys open, basically. I still question his intermediate level ball placement, but it was the defense that let Alabama down, not Tua. He also should be in that top five discussion. It was a really gutsy effort by Tua. Also, both running backs played out this game. We're going to start with uh, Najee Harris. He has re-entered that day two discussion for me he might he might have the best catch and the best run after the catch by running back this year i questioned his ability to be successful in the past game at the next level well i really don't question that anymore now he, the dude was bouncing off tacklers and the offense really got going when they committed to giving him the ball clyde edwards hilaire i mean this guy i it, it felt like his coming out party he's just a junior so i fully expect him to stay but as of now he's an early day three pick he's at fifth round territory he just doesn't have game breaking speed but he makes it up for, or at least he makes up for it with his effort plays. He was used in the passing game, which was super encouraging, and that's what really stood out for me. Now, here's a list of all the other prospects I'm going to go through. So let's just start with Jerry Judy because the guy, he looked good this game minus a couple of drops, but Bama was constant, or yeah, Bama constantly was able to put him in mismatches. He had. Uh, speaking of those drops, he had a bad drop that would have been a touchdown, but he responded the next play with a touchdown on a vicious whip route against the safety. Devontae Smith, I love Smith's ability to separate, and that was on display this game with big plays going for, what, 64 yards and that touchdown for 85 yards. I mean, he was just dominant. He dominated this game, often face, uh, facing freshman sensation Derek Steenley Jr., and I mean... It was a rough game for uh, Stanley, but he'll have better ones in the future. Guy's got great release, good hands, scary speed. We can see three Bama receivers go in the first two rounds. Uh, and a guy, he's not eligible for this draft, but Jamar Chase. This guy's going to be one of the top receivers in the 2021 class, and that receiving class is looking just as good as this year's. Now, onto the offensive line, because neither offensive line looked very good. Let's begin with uh, Alabama's Leatherwood. He gave up some pressures, but for the most part, he was able to help a limp Tua stay upright. Uh, not the strongest performance, but one that won't really hurt his rise-up boards, I think. The guy's got very light feet. And to contrast that, Willis was a bully in the run game, and he put in a solid showing. This kid could sneak himself into the first round. He is just super strong, super dominant. And then we got Charles and Cushenberry from LSU. Now, Charles, he looked overmatched this whole game. Same actually goes for Cushenberry. I mean, Edwards uh, Hilaire, he often had to make tacklers miss behind the line. These guys, I think they really proved they are day three picks and nothing more as of right now. 
on to the defense because the defense was huge for both teams this game. Let's start with uh, Terrell Lewis because I think this guy may have talked himself into the first round. He was a big reason Bama was able to disrupt the LSU offensive line. He displayed a vicious inside move and was a tear on the edge. Just ask Charles for LSU. The dude's got long arms, ridiculously strong legs. And like I said, he should be in that first round conversation. And also worth mentioning in this game, um, it was also helpful for Anthony or Anthony Jennings. He did very well, came up with two sacks. He looked pretty good. And then for LSU, Clavon Chazon. I the questions I have with Chazon is his health, but what I wanted to see is how he would look against top prospects. And he had a great game against Leatherwood. Mainly lined up, he mainly lined up against Leatherwood and he looked good creating multiple pressures. What really popped out was his ability to play in space, drop back in coverage. His amount of time missed is still a big red flag for me, but what keeps him out, and that's probably what ultimately is going to keep him out of my first round conversation, but this, this guy, I think he's firmly a day two guy. And then we got both Jacob Phillips and Patrick Queen, the linebackers for LSU, because they played very well. Both have been incredible in coverage this year and have done a fine job replacing Devin White. Both had seven tackles and a tackle for a loss, but Queen had an interception right before the half to set up the touchdown to basically for LSU to go into halftime up 20, 33 to 13. It was it was a wild game last night, <laughs> or I said last night, it happened Saturday. Then the cornerbacks for this game, Trayvon Diggs and Christian Fulton, they're right now my two and three as far as my cornerback rankings. Diggs, he had a pretty rough performance, mainly getting beat by Chase. He allowed nine receptions on 13 targets for 133 yards and a touchdown. I mean, and this is a guy coming in on the year, he only allowed 100 and I think 46 yards. So this was a pretty rough, pretty bad performance, but I mean, he's hardly showed a blemish uh, this whole year. He's been a pretty good shutdown corner. And as for Fulton, he did a stellar job on Ruggs and Waddle. I mean, he was con cons he was constantly thrown away from, and he has a clear edge over Diggs. He's a much more smooth athlete, but I love Diggs' size and athleticism. But Fulton is currently my second corner that will probably go off the board. On to the safety group. And a guy that really stuck uh, stuck out for me was Jacoby Stevens. He had himself a game. He's the leader in that secondary, racked up seven uh, tackles, a tackle and a half for loss. He spent most of the night guarding or spying Jerry Judy. And he did a pretty fine job of limiting what Judy could do. He got banged up late, and he had to come out. And honestly, later that drive, his replacement, Ray Thornton, he got targeted on a Judy touchdown, that whip route I was talking about. I mean, I currently right now have Stevens as a fifth rounder. So I like what I saw. We also saw some uh, some of Kerry Vincent Jr. this game, but he's a prime candidate to return next season, so I don't want to go too much into him. And then Grant Delpit, uh, rough game for Delpit. Delpit's ability to tackle continues to be his Achilles heel. I mean, this is his second straight year with double-digit missed tackles, but I don't think it hurts his status for me. Tackling can be taught at the next level. What makes him a first-round talent to me is his coverage versatility. He can cover the running back, tight end, wide receiver. He can really do whatever you ask of him as long as you're not tackling him. <laughs> I mean, now those things, they're, they're hard to be taught. And because of that, a lot, uh, a lot, and I mean, with coverage, a lot of it's based on athleticism. And he will not be limited because of his athleticism at the next level. That's what makes him still like a top 10 pick for me. And then Alabama, Xavier McKinney, a hot name. People love this guy. He's a prospect that just people are drooling over. And it's easy to see why. He had 13 tackles with two and a half uh, tackles for loss, two sacks. He even blocked an extra point. But he continues to get eaten up in coverage. He allowed Edwards uh, Hilaire to get behind him in the red zone for a touchdown. His coverage laps are a bit concerning, but there is no denying his talent. And he should probably be a day two pick. But that's it for the video. Go ahead and do the YouTube thing. Hopefully this was informational and I look forward to bringing more draft content to you as the uh, <laughs> season goes on. I don't know. I had to take a breath. It's because I'm sick, man. I, I got the sniffles, man. And they're really kicking my butt. But until next time, you be easy, my friends. Later.